Hey everyone, uh, yeah, I'm gonna talk about rethinking deployment for the future because the future is where all the cool stuff is happening. The present is kind of boring, so <laughs> it's just a fact. Anyways, uh, I'm Matthias, I go by Muffintosh on Twitter, GitHub. Uh, yeah, I'm Danish. Um, if you haven't been to Denmark, you should go. It's like Norway, but instead of buying one beer, you can buy five beers. <laughs> so that makes it five times better, I guess. At least as a Dane, but I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, let's get to it. So, so what is deployment? So I defined deployment as of yesterday like this. Uh, basically, it involves you have an app, right? And an app is just like a thing, it's a program. And you want to take that from your machine and you want to like kind of move that to another machine and then you want to run it. That's deployment. All right, it's pretty simple. So how do we do that? Well, the present, the boring kind. So I used to do this a lot. Basically, I would open my terminal. I would like find my app in my terminal. I'll go in there and I'll be like, oh, let's make a tarball. And I'll be really proud of myself because I could remember, you know, the tar flags that would actually make a tarball. <laughs> Um, then I would like pipe that over SSH into uh, another tarball that would extract it. And then when that's done, I would just SSH into like a server, do my build thing. And right now my build thing is just because I tend to do a lot of node, I just like npm install. And uh, then when, when everything like installed and it installed successfully because npm just scales as we learned yesterday, uh, I would just start it and everything would be fine. So I'll probably run it on a process monitor or something, but that doesn't really matter. So like this is really, really simple and it actually just works. <clears throat> but as you start to scale your program, you tend to notice one thing that is like, so I, if I have an app and sometimes I just go in and I'm like, oh, I'm just gonna you know change this endpoint to be another endpoint. <clears throat> Since I'm doing a tuple, we're just gonna we're just still gonna redeploy the entire thing, right? The tuple just takes whatever's in the current working directory and ships that. So that might not matter for like 80% of your apps or like even 90% of your apps, but like sometimes it matters a lot and then it takes a long time. So how can we do better? Well, even in the present, we can do a lot of things to make this a lot better. So yeah, that sucks. So. <clears throat> One thing we can do is like just use Git, right? So Git is kind of funny because Git is source control, but yet we also use it as a deployment tool, which I think is kind of interesting. But you know, it works. So what you what you usually do is you you have your app, right? You go into your app directory again. You do some changes, and when you're done with that changes, you just add uh, all your changes to Git. So I like to use, I like to use this uh, YOLO command where I just like add everything um, because that just works. And I'm, I'm missing a commit here, but then you would commit it, and then when you're done with that, you would just say, "Okay, cool, I'm done. Let's push it to a server." And like that server, I would probably own. I would just push it. So Git thinks it's just pushing source code, but actually it's we're actually here pushing an app, right? Um, we're just using Git as a fancy way of not pushing everything, we're just pushing like the delta. And then I would do the same thing, go into my machine, I would run npm install and uh, npm start and that would be great. Um, <clears throat> and like you could even automate the last part and put that in a, in a hook or something if you're like a, if you're really good at Git. So that's cool. Uh, so there's only one problem here. So as you see here, we, we like add our code, we push our code and then we do npm install. Uh, so the only problem with that is that npm install can be non-deterministic. Actually, fun fact, non-deterministic, I had to go through eight spellings to figure out how to spell that and what, is even, what it was even called. Uh, I thought it was like indeterministic, but Google like corrected me as soon as I got online, so that's great. Uh, so what do I mean by that? I mean, you know, you, you have a package, you do npm install, it, it, it produces the same thing. Well, yeah, that's true, and you can have like really strict similars to make sure you just get like the exact version of programs you do, right? But then there's this really fun thing in, in, uh, in package JSON that's like called an install script. 
So an install script is something that's run every time you install something. So it might be that your sim error is actually correct, or like it is even verifying that the packet you're getting from npm is like exactly the same packet. But then I might make a package that has an install script, and an install script that runs is run locally after I do after I fetch my tuple from npm. I, I can do any stuff there. I could be like, hey, let's roll a random number and delete a random file. And so that means that every time I do npm install, something different happens, right? So I mean, you might not do that. You, you can just say like, yeah, just don't do that. And I really, I am a big fan of that approach. Just don't do that. Uh, but sometimes things are out of your control and. Substack showed me a dependency tree yesterday of WebTorrent, and I, like that depends on, I think, 2,000 packages, right? So what are the chances that somebody in this chain doesn't do this? Well, I wouldn't count on it, so. <clears throat> Simple solution. Uh, I actually think I've read that a long time ago when I just started doing Node on some of uh, Michael's blogs, but instead of doing npm install after pushing stuff, just do npm install before, right? It's a simple solution, everything is fixed. So you go into your app, you edit some stuff, you just do npm install, you add your changes, Git is like, oh shit, cool, I'm just gonna add Node modules. Fucking works. Uh, Push it, go into my server, npm start, everything is fine. Well, so the problem is I'm on a, I'm on a Mac, right? Uh, so if I build something, if I like, I like to use LevelDB, for example, and that's the native module. So now I'm building LevelDB for, for Mac, and I'm pushing that into Git, and I'm usually deploying that on, on Windows. So it's just, uh, whoa, <laughs> yikes. Uh, on Ubuntu. And, uh, like it just doesn't work anymore, and usually it fails with a with a really fun error. Like you know, your system thing is out of date compared to some other thing because it's like compiled for a different platform. So like it's a really bad error, and of course I could fix it by recompiling it on the server. But now then we kind of get into the whole you know non-deterministic thing again, right? So I mean that that's also kind of sucks. So. I got really excited when I started hearing about Docker. <coughs> and I've, I realized I have a hard time uh, uh, like pronouncing Docker or whatever it's called because it's like a very um, English word for it. I usually say like Docker, but if, I don't know if that's correct. Anyways, so Docker is great. It has this idea that's like, you know, instead of you know, doing any of this, why don't you just, you know, build a freaking OS, the entire OS. Your, the entire OS is now your app. And you just, you know, package that up, and we just call that a container, because a container is a cool word. It's something we can imagine being put on a ship, and then we ship it. So it's like, you know, you can even imagine the marketing apartment being like, holy shit, like, this is the future, shipping. Um, so, yeah, that's great, right? So, so what's the flow with Docker? But it's really, really simple. So you would just go into your app, you would do Docker build, you would have a build file that's kind of like a bash script, doesn't really matter, and you would build it and you would push it. And the first time I saw this command, I was like, that looks great, but where does it push it to? I mean, it just says Docker push. Well, what they don't tell you, at least until you start reading you know, the, the fine print, is that, oh, we have this magic repository that we're just gonna give you for free because we don't wanna make money, or maybe we wanna do money, and maybe we're selling your app. Who knows, but like, you can use it for free. Uh, it's called Docker Hub. I mean, Docker Hub is great. It just works, but I mean, I just want to push to my server. I don't want to deal with Docker Hub. And, and actually, so, like Docker realizes this, so they have a repository, uh, like a hub you can run yourself, like a kind of repository thing. Have anybody ever tried running Docker Hub by themselves? <laughs> yeah, that thing is crazy hard to set up. Um, and actually, they solve it by putting that in Docker itself. <laughs> Which is great. I mean, that's kind of like, you know, what do you want? But so how do you deploy that? You deploy that by pulling that from their Docker registry and like the whole thing just spins around and it becomes really difficult. So, I mean, this is probably fine, but uh, we can do better, right? So also this thing, this thing is great. This is something I didn't realize at all. So let's say you have two machines and you check out the same app, you build your Docker thing on those app, on both machines, and then you start pushing to the registry. What would you expect happened here? Like, I first time I tried it, I was like, oh yeah, I would build it and would push it, and then I would build it on the yellow thing, and it's the same build, so it would be like, I don't need to do anything. Well, it turns out, you know, like every image in Docker has like an ID. Does anybody know what that ID means? Like what it is? 
So it's like a random string. You just generate a random string. That's your ID now. So what happens is, if you do this, everything is now pushed twice. So if I build an app, and like I depend on Ubuntu or something, and I do that on two different machines, and I push it, I'm now pushing Ubuntu twice. So I might, I might end up pushing like half a gig of data from two machines. And if I'm running like a distributed thing with, with a team that's like building this on, you know, 80 machines, we're now pushing half a gig every time we do this. Uh, so that's really annoying. Um, so yeah, that sucks. So I kind of came to this realization, you know, that it's not that Docker is bad. It's just that the idea behind Docker is so, so good that you can kind of, you know, be a little bit off in your implementation and that kind of thing because, you know, it's still way, way better than anything out there. So that brings us to the future. So I had this idea a while back on how to fix this. <laughs> um, I call it container snapshots. So what is container snapshots? Well, it's kind of like the same idea as Docker, right? So you still have a Linux container, or like an OS, and what you do is, you know, you have some steps in that. So you, you would spin up an empty OS, and then you would be like, I need to install Ubuntu because that's like my base thing. And then when I'm done with that, I would take a snapshot of that image. It's almost like what Docker does. Then I would install my dependencies. That's probably Git or curl or Node even, right? Or I would just, <clears throat> I would take a snapshot. Then I would add my app, build my app. I would take a snapshot. So it's like very explicitly snapshotting every time we do something in an in OS. So here's, here's where the fun part is. So this is kind of like a slide that probably only I understand because I just understood like a couple of weeks ago what a Merkle tree is. And now I just pretend that I knew it from like <laughs> ages. So for every of these snapshots, we create a Merkle tree of the state that has changed between the previous snapshot. So what does that mean? So I made this cool drawing that's like, if you imagine all the the green blocks being data, that like that's the actual data that has changed on disk, that's like a file that's being changed. So every time a file is changing in a snapshot, you hash that, right? So that creates a hash, so it's like a unique identifier for this, for this block. So you have two files that are the same, the hash will be the same. Then you take all these hashes and you hash them again. Then you get like a globally unique identifier for this entire snapshot. So if I produce exactly the same snapshot on another machine, it's gonna have exactly the same ID, but even better, if I produce a snapshot where like 90% of the files are the same, those 90% 90, uh, 90 of the hashes in the second layer and this layer here are gonna be the same, right? So that's really cool. So what we do then is we just take all of these snapshots and we just have every new snapshot. So we're like, when I install Ubuntu here, we take a snapshot and then I install my dependency, I take a snapshot. I just make this second snapshot point to the previous snapshot, right? So we say like that inherits from that snapshot. So that kind of looks like this, where you would have, you know, first we would install Ubuntu, snapshot that, put that in a graph. Then we would install our binary dependencies, snapshot that, put it in a graph that then points to install Ubuntu. Do the same thing again at our app. So if you wanted to roll back, you can just like roll back in this graph and go back to install dependencies and install a new app, that kind of thing, right? So it's all uh, hashed and everything. Everything is nice. And you would just replicate that but just instead of replicating the data, you would just take like these hashes and send them and do the, something really smart about sending them. So we just exchange that. So a cool thing about a hash is that a hash is very small. It's like 20 bytes, right? So very little information we end up sharing. So you know, like we just hash everything. Everything will be fine. Trust me. So I made a prototype of this at RedRebels because of, I thought it was such a cool idea that I had to build it. So I'm going to try to give a demo of it because a demo of this thing is way easier to understand, honestly, than why slides. So it's called HyperFS, and it's because I know the Substack started prefixing everything with Hyper, and I thought it was really cool. <laughs> so I'm basically just stealing his thunder and calling all my stuff Hyper something now. Um, so let's try it out. Cool, so HyperFS is a file system that basically does what I just talked about. Um, and it works on anything that supports Fuse, because it needs Fuse, so it's like uh, Mac and Linux. So anyways, let me just make this bigger. 
So what you do is you npm install HyperFS, and that just works because npm is awesome. And you do that on your local machine. And once you do that, you get this really sweet, sweet command that's called HyperFS that like prints a bunch of stuff when you run it. It doesn't matter. So what we do now is we create a volume. So volume is kind of like you know a file system where we can do stuff before we snapshot it. That's the idea. So I'm just going to call this uh, demo. So what I can do now is I can mount this demo on a mount point. A mount point is just a folder. So actually, let me do that again in debug mode. So if I then open my finder, can I zoom this thing? Handicap zoom, cool. I have a folder here called mount, and this is actually my file system. So you'll notice here that if you lo look here on the left side, that actually uh, HyperFS is printing out stuff whenever I go into this folder because it's like doing file system things. So what we can also do is we can go into this folder and we can like start making files. So touch hello.txt, put hello world inside this file. Oh, it crashed. Doesn't matter. That's what you get from having zero tests. <laughs> Actually, the thing is just my debugging message just being, yeah, it's my debugging. You know, it's the kind of thing where you never, I didn't run it in debug mode before, and like now I'm like feeling cocky and doing it at a demo. <laughs> So you, know, you just never do that. So let's just do this again because it's like probably fucked now. So create the volume and mount it. All right, let's try again. Touch, hello. Console log. I'm just going to write a text file that has some JavaScript code in it because that's great. So I'm going to put hello world in a file here. And if I cat this file, you'll see it has hello world in it. And if I run it with node, you'll see that node will be able to read this file. Cool. So what I can do now is this is actually what I just did, ran inside the HyperFS file system, right? So I can now unmount this folder. So now fold the folder contains nothing because I unmounted it. And then I can make a snapshot of it. So I can say like snapshot uh, demo. So what it does is it builds that Merkle tree that I talked about. And this is the hash of that Merkle tree. So I can still remount it. And you'll see like HyperFS is putting out this really nice message that's saying like, yo, I mounted demo and it's inheriting from this snapshot. And if I go into the folder again, you'll see we still have hello. We can still run it. Hello world, that's great. And we can edit it even. So we can be like, hello. I don't know the Norwegian word for world, but I know the Danish one. Werden. Cool. Save it and run it again. So now it says hello Werden. So it's like a regular file system, right? So here's the cool part. We can now <coughs> unmount this, and then I can create a new volume that just inherits from that old snapshot. And then I can mount that one instead. And if I go into the folder now, it'll still say hello world because like, we rolled back the state, right? So this seems really stupid because we're just writing hello world, so and, like, that is kind of stupid. So what can we use this for? Well, we can use this to just implement Docker again, um, which I kind of did in the last two days. Um, so you need lin Linux because we're going to do Linux stuff. So I just SSH into my uh, 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 <coughs> virtual machine, machine I have running on the digital ocean. So, what we can do is we can run this really, really sweet command. 
So I just learned about this the other day. Does anybody know the debootstrap command? So apparently, uh, Ubuntu has this really cool thing called dbootstrap, or Debian has this really cool thing called dbootstrap that will just install Ubuntu inside Ubuntu in a folder. So basically, you just download Ubuntu, extract everything inside a folder, kind of like, you know, you now have Ubuntu installed inside Ubuntu, but it's just the files, right? So what, of course, we do is we just take that command and we execute that inside a HyperFS file system. So what we do then is it just installs Ubuntu inside a volume, and then we just snapshot it, because then we kind of have a Ubuntu snapshot uh, using that thing I talked about before. And then when that's finished, it just downloads all of Ubuntu and it puts that in the file system. We just snapshot it, and we give it a nice human readable message here that says, I now installed Ubuntu, right? So we now have a volume that just contains like the bare Ubuntu thing. It's kind of like a base image in Docker, if you haven't played around with that. So I would like to do that now, but it takes a while to install Ubuntu, so I just cheated and did that beforehand on uh, Richard's uh, 4G network, so I'm sorry if I killed your data plan. Because um, it's like downloading half a gig of data. That's like the same half a gig that I was talking about in, in Docker, right? So what we can do is, hopefully, we can just list it here. Yeah, so I don't know if you can see this. Maybe if I make it bigger, go like Ryan and Klein Rep. So I have a snapshot here that has this message that's like, I installed Ubuntu Utopic. That's the latest version of Ubuntu, at least to my understanding. So what we can do is we can just execute a pr uh, program inside this file system. So HyperFS has this command called exec that will just execute any, prog any program inside uh, a file system. So I'm just going to spawn a Linux container inside that file system and do some stuff. So I made this node module the other day called mini container that's just spawning a very bare minimum Linux container. It's basically just like, you know, kind of like what Docker does, but just the container part, not any magic stuff. So I'm going to create a volume. Uh, let's call it one shot. That's cool. From this snapshot. And then I'm going to exec one shot mini container. That's the container module that just does the container. And I'm going to execute bash inside that one. Right. So, okay, so this is really, really bad UI, but did you, if you look really careful, you notice that my path has changed. It used to say like tilde containers, now it says slash. That's because I'm inside a container. Like I'm inside a virtual, non-virtual machine now. So I'm in the root. So this is a Linux, Linux container where I just installed Ubuntu. I ran the command before. And we can ran, run commands in here. So I have app get, I can run app get update. It will like update app get, magic. And then I can install something like curl. So what it's doing now is I'm installing curl using app get inside my container, kind of like what you would do with a Docker container. And it's just fetching curl <coughs> and installing it. And um, curl has a lot of dependencies, so it's just fetching those, fetching those also. But this is all happening inside a, a container. Like I'm not, I'm not doing that in my uh, host file system. It's just like a container that's where this is happening. So <coughs> you actually learn a lot by implementing this because I had when I first started doing this two days ago, uh, I had of course a bunch of bugs in my file system, and most of the Ubuntu things just work because they're like just assuming that the file system is really bad. So they just like, oh, how big is this file? Oh, you say it's a negative number. You probably mean this number instead, and it just works. And then you try running like any node program, and it's like exploding because you know we just expect something like the file system to work, which kind of makes sense. So um, it made me realize that I don't want to work on Ubuntu because that whole thing is just so crazy. Um, they must have a lot of tests. Um, yeah, so apparently when you install curl, it has to set up SSL certificates so the NSA can monitor what we're doing. Um, that sometimes takes a few seconds. Cool. So inside my container now, I should now have curl. And I don't know if I'm online, but I can try, like, let's fetch Google. Curl, google.com. Yeah, so it prints out something, so we're online, right? So I can now exit this container by just putting in command D that just exits the process. So now we're back in my uh, host file system. So what we're going to do now is we're going to make a snapshot of this machine. Because we just booted up Ubuntu and did some changes, but we haven't snapshotted yet, so I'm going to snapshot it. So 
gonna do snapshot and I'm gonna be like installed curl human real message so now that's going through the changes in the fastest and, and there's a few more than we did before because my curl mutates a lot of stuff and I'm gonna make like a Merkle tree of that and put that in the graph so if we list out the nodes in the graph now, you'll see that we have two nodes. We have install Ubuntu and install curl. So that's cool. And we can still boot up the, the container. So this is now booting up the container that had curl in it. And it should have curl still. But we can still make a new container. That has that's just inheriting from the, the base Ubuntu image. One shot, two. And it shouldn't have curl. So that's great, right? So we, we still have, you know, the, the other container running, uh, no, stored somewhere. Okay, so, so far we haven't really done anything that Docker can't do. It's just like a really bad version of Docker so far. So here's the cool part. <coughs> Let's try to replicate this thing. So it stores all the state inside this HyperFS uh, folder. And if I do a quick size thing for that, you'll see that it has 662 megabytes, right? So I cheated a little bit beforehand because I was on Richard's uh, 4G connection, so I had to spend some data. And I spun up another machine, completely independent, and I installed uh, Ubuntu. Same way, but like completely independent, different machine. And I cloned that to my Mac. So as you'll see here, this is my Mac now. I installed Ubuntu on another machine, I replicated that. I cannot launch it because it's Mac, Mac can't launch Ubuntu. Uh, but I have it on my file system. So if we call HyperFS, replicate and we give it a path to the machine where I was running before so that's oh not, not example.com that's I don't own that uh, I think it's like this containers so if I give it a path to this other machine what it will do is it'll exchange these Merkle trees that I talked about and figure out the diff and I'll only send the diff <coughs> of what's happening. So I installed Ubuntu on another machine. I replicated that earlier on. And then we installed Ubuntu on a new machine now and we installed curl inside that. So let's see what happens when we replicate this guy. So I made this, I feel like it should work. Yeah. So <coughs> as you can see here, it's now downloading stuff. It's downloading four megabytes because curl is like a little bit more than nothing. Um, <laughs> And it, it, you can see the really interesting part here is it also uploaded something, right? So it uploaded like 170K. Uh, so 170K is the difference between my local Ubuntu install and the remote Ubuntu install and the Merkle tree. So even though I installed Ubuntu on two different machines, they share everything, like all 400 megabytes, except for 170 kilobytes, because you know that's probably temp files. You know, when you're installing something, you might make a file that contains random data or whatever. So even though you know the images are completely different, we only exchange a little, little bit of the data. And if you run this again, this is the really cool part. Just does nothing because you know, hey, I got the same Merkle tree as you do. So yeah, I mean, we don't need to delete anything. Um, so I think that's pretty cool. Um, so that's HyperFS. <laughs> Uh, and it's on GitHub. You should check it out and give me feedback. Anyway, that's my talk. I hope you liked it. <laughs> oh yeah, and, and by the way, we, sp we spell tag with a 1K, not 2K, so I don't know why you keep making that mistake. But <laughs> Cool. Did you want to take any questions? Yeah, you got, sure. You got five minutes. I don't know. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Any kind of like, so Docker has a one layer CPU control and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Any kind of for like kind of creating more modules? Do you work at Neoform? Yes. Yeah. So I'm trying to get Matteo to do that. Oh, uh, cool. Colina. Yeah. Because so the really cool thing about the really thing that, I, that excites me about this thing 
is that first of all it's very new, so it's like easy to be excited about because I haven't found any bugs yet. And also, um, it's what I like to call modular, right? So instead of so Docker is really cool, yeah. but Docker kind of bundles everything for you. Yeah. So I would like to run this inside Docker, because, but how do I run a different file system inside Docker? I don't know, because like everything is bundled together. So the cool thing about HyperFS, in my opinion, is that it's actually not doing anything with containers. It's just doing a file system. Yeah. So you can run any container runtime inside HyperFS. So you just need to make a container runtime that has network capabilities, and it will just work. Uh, and I tried to spin up, so the core rest guys are doing this rocker, rocket thing that's really cool. That's kind of like, the idea is just make a container runtime that just does nothing, which is a really good idea. And the only thing why, the only reason why I didn't use it here was because I couldn't get it to work and I had to do my slides. Um, so I just ended up writing a really small node module that just wraps uh, some CH root stuff, which is a bad idea, but I mean, it works. Um, so yeah, definitely, definitely. Any other questions? Yeah. So why do you think uh, Docker decided to have the ideas instead of Merkle Tree? Uh, I think they want to do a Merkle Tree. Uh, so <clears throat> there's a lot of reasons. First of all, they they are doing a lot of things. Uh, they are doing a lot of cool things and like onboarding and that kind of thing and you know trying to do distributed services. So it might just be focused. Uh, I mean, it works now, and the cool, again, the cool thing about Docker is that it actually works, and it's like kind of trying to do this idea of shipping containers. So this is more like an optimization on top of that. Uh, also, you know, like these kind of things with Merkle trees and especially Merkle graphs, actually kind of new. Um, the first paper I found on this was from 2006, which is kind of like it was just before they released Git, because Git is kind of Git is kind of doing the same thing as this is doing, but just for source files. So it's relatively new. I mean, most of the stuff we do is from the 70s, right? So, so it might just just be you know unstable new technology. I really hope that I can inspire them to just do this, so everything would work better. And we'll we'll probably save the environment doing this because you know every time you pull a container, like every one of you guys here who ever done something with Ubuntu on Docker probably have a different version of Ubuntu installed on your machine. We probably have, you know, in this room, a hundred different versions of the 500 megabyte Ubuntu image, which is stupid. I mean, we should just all use the same one, or like a subset of the same one. So yeah. Cool. Thanks.